A conventional bank calls it interest rate, and an Islamic bank calls it a profit rate. A conventional bank will seize your property if you default, an Islamic bank will seize your property if you default. An Islamic bank gives you money for home financing, and a conventional bank does exactly the same thing. A conventional bank uses something called fractional reserve banking, where they keep only a reserve of the money and lend out far more than that. And guess what? An Islamic bank does pretty much the same thing. All of this begs the question, is Islamic banking just a sham? Salam folks and welcome back to the IFG channel. Today I want to address a question that many of you have asked in the comments a number of times. Is Islamic banking like a pig with a beard? Is Islamic banking like a wolf in sheep's clothing? Is Islamic banking just pulling the wool over our eyes. And make sure that you watch right till the end because there's a lot of nuance here and a lot of complicated stuff being covered and I want to make sure that you don't miss anything or misunderstand anything. I will be saying things that might even sound slightly contradictory to each other. Just make sure that you watch till the end. Before we dive in, a very exciting announcement. We have rebranded. That's why you'll see a new logo. Our website looks completely different. And even this video has been spruced up a bit as well. For those of you who are familiar with ifg.vc, our VC angel syndicate, well, that has rebranded as well. It's called Curate Capital, C-U-R-8 Capital. And the reason why we've changed the name is because it's a lot more than just venture investing now. We also do all sorts of other alternative assets, starting with real estate and lots more exciting stuff to come. The idea is that we are curating institutional grade investments that ordinary folk have historically not had access to. Even relatively affluent ordinary folks have not had access to this stuff. All that will change because we are going to give that access and then we're going to syndicate it down to our community. The second announcement is on IFG Wealth, our investing platform where you can compare and track your investments. We have added in Her Majesty the Queen as part of our insights page. So what happens is if you track your portfolio, you can now compare your portfolio to what the Queen is up to. I imagine it'll be less than hers but you can also pick up some interesting tips in terms of how she puts together her portfolio and get some ideas for yourself. Have a play and let us know what you think. It is true that Islamic finance often turns upon the technicalities, but it is also true that the technicalities have a material impact on the risk profile, the legal structure, the tax structure, the commercial implications, everything changes. The regulatory implications, everything changes. Most people who say that Islamic finance is a sham don't understand this nuance. Let's give you an example. For example, you want to buy a pencil worth 10 pounds. You don't have 10 pounds. So what you do is you go to Jeremy and you say, look, Jeremy, can you give me 10 pounds as a loan? And I'll pay you back 15 pounds later on. Jeremy says, okay, cool. He gives you the loan. You go ahead and you buy the pencil. And then over the next six months to a year, you pay that 10 pounds, 10 pounds off and you pay five pounds interest on top of that. That is debt financing. Now you have equity finance. So you go to Bilal and you say, look, Bilal, I don't have 10 pounds. I have maybe like two pounds. Why don't we go into a partnership? You buy eight pounds worth. I buy two pounds worth. Over time, I will buy out your eight pounds and I'll pay you some rent for the eight pounds that you own as well. And overall, you'll end up with 15 pounds. Now, commercially, that is exactly the same thing. What's the difference? Well, the difference is that Bilal has taken ownership risk. So if the pencil gets destroyed, then Bilal loses that eight pounds and he doesn't get the chance to charge any rent on it as well because what are you gonna rent out if it doesn't exist? And that's the key difference because the risk reward profile is different and often you would only really see the proper implications of the difference when things go wrong, which most of the time they don't. And I know some of you might be thinking, but Ibrahim, isn't this all really just the same thing? You're trying to sugarcoat stuff. You're trying to use weasel words, but it's all the same. Well, let's have a look at what the Quran has to say about this because it deals with this point precisely. The Quran says, those who consume interest will stand on the day of judgment like those driven by madness by Satan's touch. That is because they say trade is no different than interest, but Allah has permitted trading and forbidden interest. 
the verses in Arabic say that ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ قَالُوا إِنَّمَا الْبَيْعُ مِثْلُ riba. They say it's basically the same thing, it's like each other. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying there is a distinction, one is forbidden and the other one is not. And as we've just discussed, it has a material implication as well in terms of the risk reward profiles. And you know the world that is created by this kind of investment is different to the world that is created by an interest-based economy. A really obvious difference is that when you are just giving debt, when Jeremy is just giving that debt, he doesn't really care what happens to the pencil or the quality of the pencil or anything to do with the business model that you're going to adopt with that pencil. He just cares that you give back 15 pounds at the end of the year. That's it. However, Bilal, on the other hand, really does care about the pencil because that's what he's investing in. And he does care about your business model because that's what's going to get him the rent. And so the due diligence and the analysis that is conducted by people in the overall economy becomes much better. And actually, by the way, the due diligence and analysis being shoddy was some of the reasons why we had the global financial crisis because people were giving out mortgages to people who shouldn't have had mortgages. And they were doing that because they knew that it was just a debt and they could flog on that debt and it wasn't their problem any longer. The second big benefit that you get for the overall economy is that you have a lot more innovation happening because people are now having to make investments with considerable risk attached to it. And typically progress and innovation happens whenever you are taking some kind of risk and there is some kind of innovation happening. That's not the case when it comes to debt financing usually. Having said all of that, I know for a fact that many Islamic banks do use financial engineering just to replicate conventional structures and they are not particularly interested in doing the you know purely Islamic things and you know achieving that kind of ihsan level of perfection when it comes to Islamic financing. Indeed, many Islamic banks are actually staffed and even led by non-Muslims. That alone is not enough to malign them in any way. However, it does make the point pretty clear that ultimately Islamic banks are a profit driven organization and so they are likely to go for those options that are going to make them the most profit and those options are usually by aligning themselves up with conventional structures as much as possible but the overarching point is a simple one that is brought out by that which is that the profit motive is the key thing for Islamic banks and the thing that usually makes the most profit is by just mimicking the conventional structures. So as such for an Islamic bank absent any external pressure what they should do is they should try to mimic as much as possible conventional structures and then make sure that they make the cosmetic tweaks to get the Islamic scholars happy that this is actually Sharia compliant. An easy example of this is that Islamic banks don't typically use the structure involving Bilal and involving the renting of the, the pencil. They use something called commodity murabaha or tawarruk and they use it pretty excessively. Here's how it goes. Let's say that you want to get £100 as a loan. So what you do is you go to the bank and you say, can you buy me £100 of steel? So the bank goes ahead and it gives you £100 of steel and it says, this is your steel now, but you owe us £150 that so you have to give it back in a year's time. So you're now sat with £100 of steel and so what you do is you sell it back to the market, the steel market and you receive back £100 because it was worth £100. So now you're sat with £100, you've got rid of the steel, possibly back to the same place you bought it from, the bank bought it from, and the bank is owed £150. So you have in effect created a loan of £100 with a return to the bank that is more than that. And that is technically permissible using commodity murabaha. Scholars have historically allowed this and put strict guidelines in place in terms of how it must be done. Some scholars do not allow this by the way as well. And the scholars who do allow this did this for the very simple reason that you need this kind of easing approach so that Islamic banks can get themselves comfortable and get up and running. However, 30, 40 years have now passed since Islamic banking properly started. And we are still using 
commodity murabaha structures. Islamic banks are still using those temporary solutions that are allowed to get them going. Is that what the Sharia wants? Absolutely not. So how do we fix this? The solution is not to lay into the Islamic banks and think that that is going to solve everything. We must appreciate that we are operating in a system where 97% of our money supply is created through the issuance of debt. So the very fabric of our economy is based on interest-based lending. And so in that system, if you are trying to carve out an Islamic finance niche, then you are always going to be tinkering at the edges. And so that's why Islamic banks often feel like they are tinkering at the edges because, well, they are. And of course, they don't help themselves because they are often using Sharia compliance as a marketing tick box. And they are really focused on profits and not that focused on the benefit of you know, Islamic finance in 10, 20 years time or the benefit of the community in 10, 20 years time. They are focused on short term profits, but that makes them an easy target. And I would humbly put forward that actually it's not that impactful to attack them or bring them down. It's neither here nor there. And let's play it out a bit, you know, particularly in the West. Let's say we've got, you know, probably a few handful of Islamic banks and you say to them that, look, we want you to go as Sharia compliant as you possibly can be. Put aside the profit motive for a start. Stop using fractional reserve banking. You know, you're going to have to give out a hundred pounds of loans if you have a hundred pounds. And once that has gone out, you're not allowed to give any more out until that money comes back or until you get money from elsewhere. What's going to be the implications of that? Well, you know what's going to happen? Immediately, Islamic finance and its availability is going to go down by at least 10x. And so that's going to mean that less people are going to have their homes financed. And already there's a huge demand, much more so than the supply of Islamic finance in the market as it is. So that's going to just go crazy. And secondly, because Islamic banks are now essentially just a glorified landlord, they're not really a bank anymore, they will have to charge market rate rent. And when they do that, the prices for Islamic financing will go up. And so those people who say, oh, look, Islamic banks are fleecing us because, you know, we're Muslims and so they're going to charge us more. Well, they're going to just increase in their volume. And all of that is caused by us pressurizing the Islamic banks. Meanwhile, on conventional street, Conventional banks are still happily printing money, they're still happily issuing debt, and they're still happily bidding up the prices of houses as a result of that debt as well. And so house prices are going to continue increasing. More and more Muslims are now sat on the sidelines sitting this out and getting priced out of the market. And the ones that do get onto the housing ladder are going to be paying a heck of a lot more than they were previously. Is all of this halal? Yes absolutely unambiguously it is halal and i want to be really clear here what i'm describing is not an argument to say leave the islamic banks alone what i'm describing here is the implication of trying to get rid of islamic banks and then trying to create another structure within the wider un-islamic conventional system we're going to end up with a worse or equally bad solution as we currently have. So what then is the solution? Right, imagine you have a strip club. Actually, actually don't imagine that. Do not imagine that. And Cabsy, I don't want you to put any B-roll from a strip club into this as well. Okay, so let's say you have a strip club and you start campaigning in the strip club that I really want a prayer room in the strip club because you know, you need to pray, right? It's just like an airport. You need to pray in a strip club. That's the problem, you see? It just sounds absurd. And even if you, let's say you do campaign and you do get a prayer room in the strip club, great, you know, you've achieved something small and, you know, relatively insignificant. The point of all of the effort should be to get rid of the strip club or to get it to change to something that's a lot more Islamic. That's the point. That's what we should be doing with finance as well. And you know, there's a hadith when I say the strip club, people be like, hang on Ibrahim, that's a bit unfair. Why are you, you, you know, why are you bringing in that kind of stuff in here? Well, there's a hadith about how the lowest form of interest and in taking that is like doing adultery with one's mother. That's not my words, that's a hadith. 
So this is serious stuff and this is exactly the kind of sin level that we're talking about. So what are the solutions? Here are three things that I think all of us in Islamic finance and all consumers should be really focused on. As a Muslim community, we should all be robustly and rigorously putting forward ideas and campaigns about changing the structure of our economic system. There are some great works out there done by people like positivemoney.org, which is a non-profit organization that campaigns and researches on these precise topics that call for a system of banking and monetary policy that is radically different and makes sense and has the support of leading economists to replace what we currently have. And you know the sad thing? Muslims should be at the forefront of all of that campaigning and yet we're sadly nowhere to be seen in that discourse. The basic point that positive money are making is that our financial system doesn't need to have a money supply that is created primarily through the issuance of debt by private banks. Instead, it could be put in the hands of a people's bank or a people's infrastructure fund that uses that money creation to fund large infrastructure and helpful projects across society that are needed, rather than just pumping up house prices and asset prices. What that does is it creates a much reduced banking sector that doesn't use fractional reserve banking anymore and actually is just going to be an intermediary like it used to be 50, 60, 70 years ago between those who had savings and those who wanted those investments. And the bank would be a small but important part of the overall economy rather than what it is today, which is a sprawling monster that far outgrows the wider economy as a whole. The second thing that we can and must do is that for all organizations like ourselves, when you are setting up an Islamic finance product or a fund or whatever, Make sure that it's not just technically Sharia compliant. Make sure that you are focused on doing real good in the world. So an Islamic fund should automatically mean that it is an ethical fund. It's an impactful fund. It ticks all of the ESG requirements. It potentially meets the UN SDG goals. All of those kind of things should be part and parcel of what it means to be Sharia compliant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he describes halal food, he says halal and tayyib. He says halal food is good, but it needs to be beneficial and pure and it takes things to the next level. The two things must not be divorced from each other. The third thing is use Islamic banks because if Islamic banks were to collapse or disappear entirely, it would be a pretty big step, I think, in the wrong direction. Uh, I know Islamic banks are not perfect and I know it's going to be tough to change them, but I think we should use them, but then also really vocally tell them, look guys, you need to clean your act up. You need to actually do something that is useful for society. And don't expect, by the way, Islamic banks to change the world or to change themselves. The way I think about Islamic banks is, look, just clean your act up, and we shouldn't expect Islamic banks to somehow lead a revolution in Islamic finance overnight because it's just not going to happen. They're old and cumbersome and staffed by people who probably aren't the right people to lead that kind of change. The change, I think, is going to come from Islamic fintechs that are working on compelling and interesting projects structured in a different way. That's where the change is going to come from. And we should definitely support these kind of organizations but that doesn't mean that we ignore and abandon the Islamic banks because like it or not, they are important. So there we have it, folks. Those are my thoughts right now on Islamic banks. So are they a sham then? Well, the answer, if I haven't made it clear, is it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how you feel. Islamic banks are imperfect and they're not particularly motivated to do the thing that is needed and they're probably not well suited to do the thing that is needed. Sure, we should encourage them to clean up the act, just like we should make sure that if there is a prayer room in a strip club, it's well looked after. But the real thing is to go after the system itself and to make sure that that is much more aligned to something that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have wanted. But the real thing is to try and change the system as a whole, to try and go after the strip club itself and to make sure that our financial system as a whole is as close to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have wanted. And if it isn't, to continue fighting the good fight in that direction because that is what we will be judged on. And if you live in a Muslim land, 
then arguably your argument is a lot simpler to make because you're living in a majority Muslim land for heaven's sake. So make sure that you are vocally putting that point across. And there are countries that have made some significant progress in this space. So people like Saudi Arabia are really supportive of Islamic finance, Oman, Pakistan and others. However, we now need to push them to make sure that it's not just Islamic finance in name, but it is Islamic finance in substance as well. That's all for today, folks. Until next time, Assalamu Alaikum.